call to order the regular board meeting of November 19th, 2019 at 7 p.m. The Pledge of Allegiance tonight will be led by the Anchor Bay Junior ROTC. Please rise. Round of applause for the young men and women from the Anchor Bay Junior ROTC. <laughs> Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Supervisor Ecovetti. Here. Treasurer Lafada. Here. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Joseph. Here. Trustee Domingue. Here. All Trustee members. Bosberg. Here. Clerk Barry is here. All members are present. Uh, item four presentations 4A a presentation by Chris Bobrick and Donald Carpenter on the water, towns, green infrastructure initiative for the municipal office site. Director Johnson. Yes, uh, good evening board. So um, as I we mentioned uh, a few meetings back, Chris Bobrick spoke about this, just kind of giving an idea of what Clinton River Watershed Council is and what the Water Towns Initiative was about. Um, this is the plan that was going to be pertaining to this property and dealing with the improvements we're gonna be doing with our parking lot. This is stuff we can implement. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Bobrick and uh, Dr. Uh, Carpenter, and they're going to speak more on this, uh, this plan. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so my name is Christopher Bobrick with the Clinton River Watershed Council, and we've, we've spoken before. Uh, so it's a pleasure. Thank you for having us here tonight. And uh, we're going to speak to you today about the final product of this Watertowns initiative. And just to begin, I'd like to say congratulations, because you've, you've completed the task. And what we were going to see tonight from Dr. Carpenter is the renderings of what we've, um, the site visits that we've seen and the stormwater volume that's been calculated for this uh, municipal campus. And so you'll be looking at some renderings, you'll be looking at some values, and you'll be looking at other uh, units of measure that really help you understand what type of stormwater management, best management practices that you can implement. So with that, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Carpenter. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So because uh, Chris was here before, then they know about the Water Towns program at yes. large, so we can skip that part. So this uh, particular project itself, um, our goal here is to create conceptual site design plans for this area, along with artistic renderings of green stormwater infrastructure improvements. And then we're going to do uh, conceptual cost estimates of, uh, associated with that. The couple things I want to point out right away is that these um, plans are just that. You know, they're artistic renderings, they're plans. Nothing you're going to see here is uh, something you have to do. And the things that are being presented here today were done uh, at no cost to you, right? So this is a, a value-added service brought to you through the Clinton River Watershed Council and the uh, Herb Family Foundation. This year we had two communities we worked with. The other was the village of Lake Orion. So as far as the project timeline goes, um, what you were, uh, were at the final presentation of, of this, uh, we did several site visits prior to this to walk the site, um, document, photo document the site, and meet with the representatives of the community to talk about what might work and where. As far as liberal goes, you're going to get a report, in fact you already have, electronically on a little memory stick. There's a presentation, there's digital copies of all the renderings, there's um, Excel files. So it's basically everything you would need to take it to the next level, either apply for grants or use it to work with an engineering firm to try to, to get this into uh, reality. As far as the cost estimates you're going to see, we, uh, we're using, um, these are not bid-ready design estimates, there's too many unknowns for bid-ready design. 
So we have several different te uh, techniques we use to estimate the cost, mostly uh, research-based and local uh, estimates from previous jobs. The cost that you're going to see in many, um, some of them would be under if you actually put them out for bid, but a lot of them are going to be over. And what I mean by that is we assume that last bullet there says primary contract labor. We assume that um, none of the communities we work with have the capacity to do this in-house. So if you have a good Parks and Rec group or volunteers or DPW, a lot of what uh, you see here could be done in-house, which would actually bring the, the cost down. Okay. The last thing I'm going to show you guys before we uh, move uh, through these renderings is this concept of a raindrop. What this really is supposed to represent is this is the existing runoff coming off the site for uh, 2.33 inches of rain. 2.33 inches of rain represents about 98% of all rainfall that comes out of the sky. So we look to try to use green infrastructure to capture that 95 to 98% volume. It's not a flood control volume. It's really more of a water quality channel protection control volume. So as we put forth a green infrastructure example, that drop, if it was, let's say, a, a conveyance swale, maybe you're going to keep 100% of the water out of the uh, Clint River watershed, Lake, um, Lake St. Clair watershed. If you're only doing like a little bit of uh, improvement, you maybe only would do like 15%. So every rendering is going to have a drop on there that'll show you how much water is kept out for that price point. All right. So without further ado, just to kind of orient ourselves, you know, we're right there in the, uh, in the main building here. The renderings extend all the way through the historical village, but primarily around the, the campus right here. Okay. A uh, little hard to see um, just because of the scale here, but this is uh, when you have the report or if you get the, uh, the graphic boards a little closer to you, you'll be able to see where the renderings are. But we're really looking at bioswales along the roads, porous pavers along the back, and uh, naturalized shorelines up and down the drainage ditches here. So let's start with the area one, the main parking lot existing. The main parking lot is, is a bit of a sea of asphalt. There's actually opportunity to restripe this, use existing infrastructure that's in place, and put bioretention cells in the middle of the parking lot when it's redone around existing catch basin. So here's your existing catch basin. This might be what it would look like in the future, fresh coat of asphalt, striped, and then depressed parking lot islands. So you can see here that would keep about 40, about half the water from this parking lot would be kept out of the drainage ditch through this type of technique. And this is about $130,000 price tag for a series of these islands, not for one island, but a series of these islands. So a little wet area out front is kind of hard to mow, uh, especially in the springtime. So this might be a good opportunity to come in here and put in some native landscaping. And it can be as formal or informal as you would like as far as that landscaping goes. Here's parking lot two, um, heavily rutted. You know, there's an additional parking lot over there. It's a good opportunity to actually connect these two parking lots and have a better traffic flow pattern. So put in porous pavers along the edges, regular traditional asphalt in between, and then have a bioswale that kind of ties everything together. And then this is what that bioswale might look like. That's your existing drainage swale. So naturalizing it, making it more native um, looking. Here's uh, the front off the side. So that we already talked about area one, that's the parking lot in the back. So wherever there's an opportunity to curb cut and put water into these swales, we look for that as an opportunity. Okay. Shoreline, right now the shoreline is being mowed pretty close to the drainage, um, the drainage canal. What we really want to do here is actually limit the amount of mowing, try to extend the native riparian buffer up. So you could actually do native shoreline in this area right here, different plant species available to you. And then there's also an opportunity, perhaps, if you want to put in like a picket fence or some signage to try to bring differentiation between the canal and the, uh, the um, walkway there. And again, it can be as native or as wild or as um, manicured as, as desired by the Parks and Rec and the DPW staff. Existing shoreline, kind of nat naturalized and native shoreline. Um, this is one of the, uh, I think, a really good opportunity. Chris is going to talk to you in a minute here about um, some mini grant opportunities, but there's an existing drainage system right here. This is at the edge of the historic village before you cross the bridge. And this is a really good opportunity to put in a rain garden, put in some educational signage associated with that. Um, pretty good price point for this type of uh, facility. So about $5,000 for that. So in totality, a lot of these prices have to do with the fact that there's some repayment going on there and um, some porous paver material, which is a little bit more expensive. But what we're looking at, <coughs> 
It's about a little over a half million dollars of total improvement. Uh, as you were looking, as I was clicking through, some of these things are only like $4,000, some are $200,000. But for that price tag, you're keeping 150,000 gallons of water in storage out of the system every time it rains, up to a 98% uh, rainfall event. So for the price of about three and a half dollars per gallon, you're capturing and treating that water in perpetuity with some routine maintenance. I'm gonna run through a few examples. Uh, as we mentioned, the Water Towns program's been around for five years. We've, had, uh, we've worked with now with uh, 19 communities, so, so there's actually quite a few examples that have worked out in the past. Uh, Chris, you wanna actually go through the, what's yeah. available to them? Sure, All right, so. absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. Um, so I wanna bring this back to the Water Towns initiative that's funded by the Herb Family Foundation. And so as part of this, we have this really data-rich package that's gonna be delivered to you uh, free of charge. Um, but in addition to that, you also have an opportunity for a $5,000 matched mini grant. So up to a project for $10,000, $5,000 will be matched by you know, the Herb Family Foundation. Um, so it requires one-to-one -one match. That can be in-kind um, volunteer services, uh, like Dr. Carpenter stated, and planting or other cases that we've seen is we purchase plants and then um, you're able to construct the actual rain garden or, or bioswale um, wherever in that location. Um, so we'll help with the implementation, we'll actually help with the planning of that. Uh, we want you to use this money, so it's a great opportunity to jumpstart uh, a demonstration garden or um, like in the historic village location as well. Um, would you like to go over the implementation? Sure. Um, so I'm going to show you just a few of what uh, communities have done so far. Um, these are the Watertown communities that, we're, that we've worked with uh, thus far. You are uh, the 20th, so congratulations. Uh, I look forward to working with you on this uh, in the future. So this is uh, first example for Clarkston back in 2014. Um, they had an idea that they had this uh, bridge that needed to be replaced. It was uh, deleterious shape, so um, a community member actually thought that the Watertowns program was so uh, special to that community that he donated uh, enough money to build that entire new bridge, which was about a hundred thousand dollar bridge. Um, but part of the Watertowns program was working with volunteers to actually construct some of these rain gardens surrounding that bridge into that entrance, um, and then also uh, part of that was a, a, river, a bank restoration project as well. That, that gentleman there that's kneeling down in the white shirt, he's the one who donated. Uh, so fantastic project and really a success story uh, for this program that was in its infancy that year. Um, this is Clinton Township. They wanted to naturalize the fishing pond outside their municipal uh, campus. Um, up top you see the rendering on the bottom is what it really looked like at the beginning. Um, and this was a progression after they naturalized that, that shoreline. The first year in 2015 um, in 16, a little bit more wild, and then you can really see in 2017 how it's grown up and really established itself, and um, is in still really good condition today through uh, some minimal maintenance through their DPW department. Uh, also in Clinton Township, they uh, established some of the bioswales in their parking lot. In fact, they uh, redid their entire parking lot, similar to what we have uh, the situation here. Um, so it's a little difficult to see, but this parking lot was at the end of its life, um, and a little bit of redesign and uh, incorporation of some green infrastructure uh, components. It really turned out to be a wonderful project. Um, you see some of these parking lot islands that are collecting the rainwater, and some of the simple plants, uh, the simple planting palette that they put in there, um, so they can successfully sustain this maintenance for that. Uh, it's just another example of that bioswale out front. Uh, this is Rochester Hills outside the Clinton River Watershed Council uh, headquarters, which would be a great place to really have a rain garden, right? would be uh, champions in this, in this effort. So this uh, low-lying area collected all the rainwater from the parking lot and driveway. Um, we see that a little sediment forebay was designed uh, to collect the water and then a uh, a relatively large rain garden to, to uh, store some of that rainwater. And beyond that is, it would drain directly into Avon Creek, which goes directly into the Clinton River. Uh, and this is after it was implemented. Sterling Heights, um, 
Senior Center, another parking lot situation where they had these parking lot islands that were uh, concave. Um, and what they did was uh, inverted those and planted those with uh, native grasses to collect some of that storm water from the parking lot. And so those are just a few examples of what can be done uh, with the renderings that are presented to you today. Um, another example that was not on there was Huntington Woods. They had the same similar package of uh, various items to, to look at and think about in regards to green infrastructure. But what they decided to do was use that mini grant to construct a demonstration rain garden. Um, so they matched that $5,000. In fact, we constructed that uh, with our help and some volunteer help, uh, constructed that rain garden less than that amount. And so uh, what they are doing now is using the remaining amount of that mini grant as a maintenance plan that will extend into three or four years, I believe. So that rain garden is going to be sustained until it's established in a few years. Um, would you like to add anything else? No, I thank you for your time. Um, and please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you for uh, the work you did in coming to Chesterfield and all you do for the region and the watershed. Any questions from the board? Thank you so much. We'll sure, be in touch. Thank you. Moving on to item number five, department reports. Would any departments like to update the board or the public on any specific issues? Good evening, everyone. They're going to be setting up for a minute. I'm going to go ahead and start. A um, few things we want to discuss tonight. Uh, first thing I want to discuss is uh, I am no expert, but the water levels are concerning to me. They have not gone down this fall like we were hoping. So uh, I want everybody to please try and be prepared. Do as much as you can. We're still going to be supplying sandbags and sand. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about the levels for next year. I don't know what it's going to do, but I want to keep everybody aware and let your neighbors know on the water that uh, I think it's going to be worse next year than it was this year. So we'll be, we'll be there to help whatever we can do through the DPW. Um, talking about this building, um, the HVAC in this building is over 25 years old now. And uh, it's talking to the, the guys that work on the system here, we, we would like to, our team has discussed this, we would try and like to get an engineer or different engineering companies in here to give us an assessment on how this system is uh, eventually here. This is just for mentioning uh, and what it's going to take to update this system. The problem with all these little VAV boxes is the parts are going to start getting to where we can't buy the parts pretty soon. So just something to run by you guys. We would like to have a scope and a plan and have somebody come in and give us an assessment on what this system's going to need because we're, we're afraid that uh, it's, it's, it's past its useful life already. Okay, uh, Josh is getting ready for some stuff. Um, I did want to mention also to the board that uh, we have had help with cutting the grass on this property and we, we may ask the board too going forward to have help with the snow removal with this property and with the police department and then our guys and our team taking care of the rest of the township uh, buildings. We're, we're down a couple guys so we just don't want to get caught with not being able to keep up so I want to put it in your guys mind too that we are going to be uh, getting some bids from several companies to see what it's going to take to get help for this building and the police department. And our guys will take care of the uh, DPW, the fire departments, library, and the other buildings we feel that we can keep up with, and all the, all the uh, DPW buildings. Okay, so winter's coming. We all know uh, we do open up Pollard Park almost all year round, but we are, we are proposing that we think we should close Pollard Park uh, in the winter and save on that all that snow plowing. There's really no reason to keep it open. The concession stand, everything out there is closed. It's winterized and shut down. But uh, that, 
That is a picture of Pollard Park. All the red shows all the paving on there. Uh, and the, the green shows uh, the lane that we would keep open for snow plowing for emergencies only in case there was an issue at the back building. We would have it wide enough for police and fire vehicles to get in there and we'd like to uh, close that park right off for the winter time. We really see no, no reason. We'll go in there and plow and keep a lane open to get in and out, but we really see no reason to keep it open once winter, the heart of winter gets here. Josh is also going to show you uh, Brandenburg Park, the, I guess it's the darker green are the, the main big parking lot and, and some of the parking lot back by the garages and stuff. We, we don't want to have to plow all of that either. The, the lighter green we will plow and keep open and obviously a lane around the uh, concession stand and everything there so emergency vehicles and fire trucks can get up, up to and, and back and forth from there also. So that's our thoughts on the snow removal. At, at those two parks. So we'd like to, to uh, the board's blessing on closing them parks in the winter. That Brandenburg will be open, but we, there's no sense in plowing everything, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll block off the, the big main parking lot so people can't get in there. And that's all I have for department reports. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Dwink. Chair, before you go, I know we've got this uh, water project going to go out by the pier at Brandenburg. I'm not sure when the kickoff is with you and Josh, but I know there was talk of uh, us closing Brandenburg during that. Is this going to be anything during the winter before the ice gets in? Or I know you guys had talked on that, so if we're going to if we're going to do this project and close Brandenburg, there's no sense to plow the snow. I'm I'm getting a little. So I guess I need a little input on this. So our plans as of today is we're going up to bid very soon. And once we get the bid results back, the goal of the project is to start 1st of January. But it all depends on how the numbers come back, like every project. You know, the big component of that project is limestone. And we're told that there's a lot of limestone still in the quarries. But until we get our prices back, that's going to affect how that project moves forward. So our plans as of now, and I'm sure I'll be coming back to you in early December, would be if that project works out the way we expect it to with all the work we've put into it, that we would very well propose starting that project January 1, we would post signs, we would close that park completely from January 1 to Memorial Day. While we did all the interior work, we're, as we discussed in our last meeting, or the meeting before, that we were gonna put a separate entryway for the trucks and all the traffic. We would keep the park closed till Memorial Day and that would allow us to do the seal coating and all the parking lot maintenance. But I do think moving forward, that these simple plans kind of scale down the workload and even if whether it's contract or in-house work by scaling down some of these areas a it prevents less work that we have to do and b it prevents wear and tear on our parking lots as we've all seen the cost of the paver studies and asphalt replacement moving forward we're just trying to find ways to narrow the scope because for the little bit of use that Pollard gets it's my understanding it would just make sense to just to kind of keep us out of there so we don't have to go through and keep a huge parking lot clear throughout the winter. Plus the fuel and the wear and tear on the vehicles and everything else. I, because my suggestion would be if we're gonna start this project in January and then we don't plow Brandenburg, the only thing I would say is we plow is the uh, bike path, the, the walking path, because a lot of people use that even during the winter, but I would say they just shut, the, shut all Brandenburg down, at least that by me, in my opinion, I don't know what my six other board members would decide, but if we're gonna start the work at Brandenburg, there's no sense of us even to plow what you had but I would definitely keep the, the bike path open. That's my two I thoughts. agree. I think our only concern was until we get the signs posted, a lot of ice fishermen and a lot of people use that park for various reasons. So what we'd like to do is once we know that project's going forward, we're actually going to start posting signs on the outside, you know, uh, fence going up to the park. But what we, we just don't want to get over our skis here and commit to something until we start getting the numbers back and telling people that we're shutting down the park completely. For the plowing purposes, I would like to commit to that. But the overall closure, once we get the numbers back from the park, then we can move forward with the... Okay, the thank you, Josh. Closure. Thank you, Jared. We will keep the bike path open. Okay, okay. thank you. Trustee Vosberg. Thank you. Are um, any parts of Pollard Park used even just as for dog walking or cross-country skiing, anything in the wintertime? I know that I've been told, I haven't necessarily witnessed it, but I've been told that some people do use that walking path. But we do make every effort to keep 
there, if you go to that walking path now, there's a lot of wear and tear because of plowing. The problem is the plows are too wide and when you go to make those turns, you tear up so much grass and greenery that you spend a lot of time. It's not only the plowing, it's doing the repairs in the spring. So I think for wear and tear on those paths, I know we keep the path back here. I would be a big advocate if you want to walk your dog, come here, go to the Jefferson path. We also keep that one clean. It's just hard with our limited resources to keep all these paths clean. Okay, so the, the grounds itself is not used during the winter time at Pollard? I don't think there's any functions out there. Yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no recreational that functions that we sponsor there in the winter. No, none just sponsor, but any any passive activity, none that you're aware of. Not that of. I'm aware of. We'll find out. Yes, we close will. It out. Thank you. Any other fur further comments from the board? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Coddington and Director Sonnenberg. Any other uh, department reports? Um, it's trustee. Oh, say again. Looks like you're up. Okay. Trusty Joe. Um, quick, real quick from Parks and Rec. Please join us on Friday, December 6th at the Chesterfield Municipal Offices for our tree lighting. Santa rise outside at 7 p.m. It's a festive evening of caroling and activities that include crafts, coloring contests, writing letters, or visiting with Santa, wagon rides, and jolly surprises. The Township Grounds will be a glow for this festive night. Are you passionate for, for creating healthy lifestyles? Do you have a love of your community? Do you have enthusiasm? Then you are fit for the, to be a member of the Chestfield Parks and Recreation Committee. This time we have some openings. This group volunteers their time, generating ideas, promoting programs. The advisory board meets once a month at 6.30 p.m. If you'd be interested in joining this team, then submit a letter of interest to the Township Supervisor with a copy to Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Thank you. Any further trustees wish to update on the various subcommittees or goings on? A couple of quick ones for me. One is uh, Jefferson Road Bridge. Um, lots of frustration and issues with that project. The contractor will be pouring or is scheduled to pour the remainder of the concrete for that project this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We, I was hopeful that the county would be able to open up the north section of Jefferson to uh, Point Lakeview uh, before the entire bridge gets opened up, um, which is going to be at least two weeks after the last concrete is poured due to curing and for that concrete getting strength. However, um, it was relayed to me that two more slabs um, did not meet the uh, quality requirements of the county and needed to be replaced in that section. So that piece will not be open um, until the entire bridge gets open. This is a Macomb County project. Um, it looks like it's scheduled as of now to be opened the first week in December. So Trustee Domenica, I think you were, uh, you were correct in your, your estimate from some time back. So they're having a, they're having a whale of time a whale of a time uh, as a as, as a uh, as a project. It is having a tremendous impact on um, on our our township. It will uh, it will get done, and there are considerable penalties being handed down to that contractor. And I will continue. I've asked for updates at the beginning and end of every week on major milestones um, from here on out, and uh, that is what I'm doing. I'm communicating them to the board and the residents. Um, next week, the township will be closed Thursday and Friday, and the trash collection will be pick, uh, will be one day delayed. And the last day for a compost pickup in Chesterfield will be December 12th uh, this year. That is all the quick updates I, I have. Item six is the consent agenda. All items under the consent agenda are considered routine by the board and will be enacted in one motion. There is no separate discussion of these items. If discussion of any item is required by a board member, it will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Public comments on the consent agenda are permitted. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with the removal of the closed session from the agenda. Motion to adopt the consent agenda with the removal of item 12A, closed session. Motion by Clerk Perry. Support. Support by Trustee Vosberg, discussion. Comments from the public. Motion by Clerk Berry. support by Trustee Vosberg to approve the consent agenda. 
as amended, which is the removal of the closed session from the agenda. Clerk Berry, please call the roll. Clerk Berry, aye. Trustee Vosberg, aye. Trustee Anderson, aye. Trustee Joseph, aye. Trustee Domingue, aye. Treasurer Lafada, aye. Supervisor Acovetti, aye. Item 7 is the regular agenda 7A approve a recommendation by Public Works along with facilities and operations to purchase two new HVAC units for server rooms located at the police station and the DPW from Great Lakes Mechanical at a total cost of $32,500. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion by Support. Trustee Minks, support by Trustee Anderson. Director Sonnenberg. Good evening. The units that are mentioned in your package are two units, obviously, one related to police and one related to DPW. Uh, the unit in the police department is undersized and we've had trouble with it, so we want to get that unit replaced. The other unit in the DPW, we actually don't have a unit. We used a temporary cooling system for a long time, but now that's a critical component, that server room for us. So we want to install two permanent units. We've got multiple prices. We went through multiple scenarios. We weighed a, an, uh, like a, a split system, let's call it, which is similar to a residential system, and we went through different scenarios. They all came back to this Liebert system that's in front of you, which is a little bit more expensive, but it's the right system for the job. A server room produces a dry, unique, high heat volume, and this unit is made to run 24-7, 365 days a week and combat that at, at the best possible efficiency that we could find. They are a little bit more expensive, but we came to the agreement that this is the unit we'd like to move ahead with. They also, on average, have an 18 to 20 year average life. So it's a pretty good unit, pretty reliable. Once you put them in, we don't have a lot of problems with them historically. Um, so we'd like to move forward with the uh, Great Lakes purchase. Great Lakes has done some other projects for us as well. As you know, they've done the uh, large rooftop unit in the senior center, which was a big CBD G grant. They did that and they've done, uh, they do some of our maintenance to us. So we're happy with them as a contractor and we've, we are happy with their price as well. Any questions from the board, Tr Trustee Mink? I'm good. Oh, I just saw your little green light on, trick oh, me up, Trustee Bosberg. Yes, I, um, I noticed the box wasn't checked that IT had reviewed it, but you, I called you and you. I apologize, yes, yeah, I spoke with both IT groups, our police IT group and our, also our, the high tech IT group here, and both IT groups were in support of this. In fact, uh, Jeremy with the police department provided a really detailed study and actually had Dell Computer and others do a modeling for us, which I have a big white paper if anybody's interested talking about you know, exactly why these units should be used. So we did a lot of detailed work and I apologize about not checking that box, but both IT departments were 100% on board. Further comments from the board? Any? Just one, just oh, one question. Joseph. The um, executive summary, it looks like um, Lion Building Services with the asterisk, fair to say they really didn't meet the uh, parameters of the bid. Um, their, their inability to provide the humidity control sort of takes them out of the running. It's not that, they just went a different route. So they looked at a split system like it was a cheaper option, but really we were really going on, you know, with this system it's critical. So we weren't really looking for the cheapest, we were looking for the best scenario with the best price. So that's why their, their system, what they proposed, it wasn't necessarily apples for apples. We did look at it, we inquired, we looked into it, but it just didn't, what it does is it doesn't control the humidity. What you get with a server is a lot of dry heat. Right. And in order to avert, avoid static electricity, you need some humidification. That Liebert system handles that. So the question that I had for you is in the background, the server rooms must meet specific conditions, able to support the network, avoid crashes. And then you get into the maintaining the proper temperature and humidity levels. So my question is, was Lion Building Services, the, the units that they've outlined for police and DPW, does that price reflect um, no humidification? And so in order to provide that second component, a different unit, um, would the cost be more or was that inclusive and it was a two-part system? It was there, there was, there was a lot of things that came into question, just as you mentioned. Yeah. We would have to pi apply a separate humidification, almost like you'd have in your home, yeah. where it's not really digitally re regulated, which you come into problems with. You know how you got to adjust it from summer to winter? There's not really an automated control that was included in this, correct? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further comments on agenda item 7A? Any comments from the public? Motion by Trustee Domingue, support by Trustee Anderson to approve item 7A as submitted. Clerk Bayer, please call the roll. Trustee Domingue. Aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Vosper. Aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Supervisor Acovetti. Aye. Clerk Barry. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank item you. Item 7B. 
set a public hearing for December 3rd, 2019 to hear comments on the proposed township budget for fiscal year 2020. Do I have a motion? Motion to set a public hearing for December 3rd, 2019 to hear comments on the proposed township budget for fiscal year 2020. Motion by Clerk Barry. Support. Support by Trustee Vosberg. Discussion. Trustee Joseph. Yeah, just a, just a quick comment. We had our first budget workshop uh, last night. It was pretty productive. There was a lot of information in there. And I know that uh, this is set for the third and typically we would move to approve if there are um, no no problems I would just like to point out the budget is uh, there, there's some there's some significant changes in the budget this year um, at least for me and trying to track these so I know we are in the process of scheduling another budget session uh, workshop group um, there is a chance that we are not uh, in a place on the third but I'm assuming that we would go forward with the public hearing hear the public and and uh, at least satisfy the public hearing not necessarily approving a budget at that time uh, um, correct? I, I will be um, submitting the budget for approval on December 3rd and that leaves us with one more meeting um, before the end of the year to to pass the budget um, but I will be a, a not only will we have the public hearing on the budget but there will be an agenda item to approve the budget that I'll be proposing no, just to clarify, just to clarify, you, you could you could put whatever you want on the agenda. I'm just saying there's nothing that requires us to approve the budget on the third. Statutorily, we're obligated to approve the budget by the end of the year. That's correct. Thank it's you. A, it's a board decision. That, that is correct. Thank you. Any further comments from the board? Comments from the public. Motion by Clerk Barry, support by Trustee Vosberg to approve item 7B as submitted. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Clerk Barry, aye. Trustee Vosberg, aye. Trustee Anderson, aye. Trustee Joseph, aye. Trustee Domingue, aye. Treasurer Lafada, aye. Supervisor Acovetti, aye. Motion passes. Item 7C approve an amendment to consent judgment for Hampton South LLC versus the Township of Chesterfield, Brookview Estates, altering the use of the site from a two story multifamily senior living complex to an 82 lot single family site condom development. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion by Trustee Vosberg. Second. Supported by Clerk Barry. Director Palin. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Uh, this project here was brought forth by the property owner. Uh, over the last couple of years, there's been several interested parties that have come in either to develop under the current consent and judgment or to amend it to um, something similar. In all those cases, it did not work out. So the property owner, property owner came to the township with several options that he was looking to do. Um, we, we settled on this option as probably the best route, and um, we've worked through several meetings, kind of talking through issues with the site and what, what best fits. So they are, they are proposing, <clears throat> excuse me, an 82 lot single family development. This would reduce the overall density from the original consent judgment from 6.3 units per acre to just over 2.7 units per acre. They are smaller lots. They range from 40 feet to 46 feet. Um, a couple of the things that we we asked the property owner to to include in this, which he, he did, um, was to recess the garages so the front of the house was the more predominant feature, gives it a more neighborhood feel. Um, the other was to extend the walking path to the north to Monty, um, which will get us almost to the township property to create a connection there. So we need to work with Macomb County on that and getting a connection through the through their drain easement. Um, and then you know several other minor things that we work through um, with this. So it has been reviewed by the township and the consultants. Uh, we are recommending approval on this. And I can answer any questions. And I believe Mr. Baker is here from Selfridge that uh, would like to speak on it as well. And I did include consultant reviews as well as the report from Selfridge in your packet. Any questions from the board before I bring it up to the public? Any comments from the public? State your name for the record if you can and state of the topic. Good Welcome. evening, board members. My name is uh, Ken Baker. I work at Selford Journey National Guard Base. I'm the Air Installation Compatible Use Zone Program Manager. Um, 
We received the, the site plan uh, from the Planning and Zoning Department uh, in October, and we reviewed it. Um, we understand it's under consent order for residential use. Um, it's, however, it's, it's, it's something we thought would be worth discussing was that it's in, inside the accident potential zone. It should be in the package. It should show our accident potential zone one, accident potential zone two. Residential development within accident potential zone one is not recommended, um, which would be the use on the property. Um, also, there's a detention pond identified. I'm not sure what the, if, how the detention pond would be designed when it's constructed, but uh, on-site standing water within the 10,000 feet of the AOA is not recommended on air, under an Air Force advisory circular regarding wildlife hazard attractants across our approach and departure, which this property would be in. So uh, we just were wondering if you had any questions regarding our comments or concerns uh, that we provided in our letter, and also, not that uh, we were planning to get F-35s, but if well, there were five bases looked at for F-35s, two preferred alternatives were selected. A final decision on that hasn't been made, but the subject property would be inside the 65 to 70 decibel noise contour if the F-35s did come to Selfridge, and that would not be compatible use. Another residential use in that, inside that noise zone would not be compatible. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions from the board or comments from the board? Or... Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your time. Your um, Trust, Trustee Vosberg? I think you might um, direct it at, do you have a, do you have a question? Yeah, I, maybe to legal counsel, I'm not sure who needs okay. to answer this. So um, given the comments that were just made, um, I'm thinking, well, it's still the private developer responsibility, is it? Or is there, do we, should we be considering some of those comments that were just made about the sound? The board can certainly consider them, yes, because it's an amendment to the consent judgment and you're not required to amend the consent judgment. But keep in mind that the amendment is reducing the density. Correct, but I, I'm just, if people choose to live there, and there's noise. That's that's their. If they choose not to live there, that's that's not our. Is, is that our concern? Based on the report that we just heard about the noise level from Selfridge, or the the fact, um, you know, the, the being in the flight pattern. Well, did something certainly you can take into consideration, but you're not required to. That's we're not required to. You're not required. To. All right. Thank you, Trustee. Joseph? Yeah, just um, from a planning uh, and zoning related you know, background on this, what concerns me is the uh, developer has come forward with a number of plans and there are things that are available to them under the current zoning um, that I think, as you pointed out, Mr. Palin, that, that would be a higher density, potentially a higher density uh, with more residential in that space. What's concerning to me as we work together with our partners on Sel at Selfridge is any development on the south end of the township potentially becomes, um, you know, condemned. You just can't do anything with it um, for, for fear of being in a, an APZ, um, noise uh, parameters, you know, the perimeter of the uh, decibel level for an aircraft that is not here. And I know the sustainability study is hopefully going to address some of these things, but it gets very, very difficult to, uh, you know, pay for the services that we would like to provide our residents with when we have districts that are unable to be zoned as they are currently afforded to be built in the master plan. There are things that this developer could do in that space with their property that is perfectly in compliance with the ordinance and uh, the the, the current zoning, they've come back and said we're, we're concerned about uh, some of the things that are being mentioned and you know, Selfridge is always part of our uh, planning whenever we have an issue that could involve uh, you know, our partners on the base. But at some point, um, what, we have to make a decision about what to do with the south end of our township because we have a lot of things that get caught up into this um, and these um, APZs, um, sort of change with the uh, idea of bringing in uh, different aircraft and so forth. I, I really, it's a very tricky place to be um, because we want to be good partners, but we also have an obligation to allow people to do 
uh, what they're legally afforded to do with their land. And on this particular case, this is a developer that's come back to the Planning Commission several times to try to work out what, what could work. And this, to me, is the best possible uh, in terms of reducing some of the density. And so um, I, I think our legal team and our planning to uh, bring this consent is about as good as we can get. If we don't approve this, then I think what we're saying is just don't build on that uh, until we find out what's going to happen at Selfridge. And I don't know that that's fair to any property owner. It seems to me that if there's a concerted effort to bring in, you know, a game changer like the F-35, that these developers should be, these property owners should be um, compensated for their land. If you're going to turn that property into an APZ, uh, compensate the landowner. But what we're doing is an extension of a condemnation process. We render this property uh, unusable, and that's really just not fair. It just, it just doesn't seem right to me. This consent, uh, this consent judgment does its best to capture uh, the density issue in, uh, and mitigate problems in, in the most reasonable way. So again, I, I think if we don't approve this, we might as well just say uh, Chesterfield South is an APZ. Thank you. Any further comments from the board? Any further comments from the public? Um, you, you can come up one more time to the uh, to the microphone. Sorry. Um, uh, just just for clarification, with respect to the acts and potential zones, APZ one, APZ two, those do those do not change. Those have been consistent for the last since the air, the study was done in two thousand nine, as well as previously for the previous twenty or thirty years. The thing that would change would be noise contours with respect to with respect to aircraft, and the F thirty fives were not selected. So currently, the property would be outside the sixty five decibel noise contours, and Selfridge was not one of the selected two from the five that were identified. So I just wanted to do that for clarification. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Mr. Baker. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any further comments from the public? One quick one from me. Um, I appreciate Selfridge, um, your strength to the south and being there um, in Macomb County and your importance here and your, um, you doing your job being here, you're doing your job, talk, uh, defending that base and um, <clears throat> communicating the concerns um, that that runway could have on our community and other neighboring communities. Thank you for doing your job. Um, we have also got a job to do up here as a board. Um, this consent, this there's, a, there's an existing consent judgment on this that would require a heck of a lot more density. That also does not meet um, uh, is a non-compatible use. Um, at the end of the day, I think this is a more compatible use, um, even though it's still not compatible than what is, is allowed to be built right now under the consent, of judge, consent judgment. We work with you as much as possible um, with dealing with detention slopes um, uh, for, bir for the bird strike issues, and we'll continue to work with, uh, with you as much as possible to be good partners, and we, <coughs> we expect you to do the base to do the, the same um, to us. This is a an amendment to a consent judgment that I do support. I think it is more compatible with Selfridge, and I think it is more compatible with uh, our community than the legacy consent and judgment that we are changing. Motion by Clerk, motion by Trustee Vosburgh, support by Clerk Barry to approve item 7C as submitted. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Trust Trustee Vosburgh. Aye. Clerk Barry, aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Demink. Aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Supervisor Acovetti. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. 7D. 7D. Consider the Planning Commission's recommendation for con conditional rezoning number 351, parcel number 0931351-026, from C4 multi-use commercial to C3 general use commercial. Do I have a motion? Supervisor would like to make a motion to. Uh, oh, sorry. Supervisor would like to make a motion to approve the Planning Commission's recommendation for the conditional rezoning uh, number 351 parcel uh, 0931351026 from C4 multi use commercial to C3 general commercial. Support. Motion by Trustee Joseph, support by Trustee Domingue. Director Payne. 
Thank you. Uh, this request uh, came forward. The applicant is looking to do a car wash on the site. Um, the car wash is not permitted in the C4 district, uh, which is the multi-use commercial district, so they are proposing the C3 general commercial. Uh, please keep in mind that this approval is not an approval for the car wash. It is just for the land uses permitted in the C3. Um, the applicant would still have to come back for special land use approval and site plan review on the car wash. Um, after the public hearing, the, or at the public hearing, the applicant brought forward some conditions on the, on the proposed rezoning. Um, there was a letter from Mr. Kirk included in your packet with those uses that, that, that would not be permitted, such as automotive dealers, hotels, um, automobile repair, adult bookstores, bowling alleys, some of the more intense land uses that may be less desirable. Um, after the public hearing, the uh, Planning Commission has recommended approval to the Township Board. Um, the approval would be subject to an agreement being um, drafted, reviewed, and approved, um, outlining those conditions of the, of the rezoning. Questions for Director Reeling? Uh, is that what is, uh, Council, is that what you uh, spoke to us earlier about? Yes, it is. Okay. <clears throat> Trustee Joseph. Just to, just to add that this, um, this was a very unique project and a very unique idea. It um, complemented the existing uh, businesses that are in that uh, C4 district and added to the, um, to, to the uh, property in a really um, unique way. It was, a, it was a great idea. When the discussion came to the planning members, there was a lot of debate about uh, if we rezone from a C4 to a C3 that it could be, uh, and then we listed, and you know, people had concerns about a number of things that it could be, which are permitted uses in C3. Petitioner was very clear. Um, they have the uh, sort of size, scope. Uh, we didn't, uh, you know, approve the building just yet, but we, they, they have a very um, specific idea about what works there, and uh, it was very well received by the uh, Planning Commission. Um, great project, and uh, I think the only thing left is just to get the uh, details of the conditional rezoning uh, to council, and um, it, it really is a great addition to that parcel. Any further comments, for Trustee Dominguez? One more, uh, Trustee Joseph. Reading your comments in from planning, uh, there was only the one uh, party. I guess I'll address that uh, was opposed to it, but that party doesn't even uh, that party who had complaint was not even part of this township, correct? Yeah, uh, I, I, we had actually two, uh, two individuals that came forward, one individual that came forward in person, um, and I had great respect for him. He is a uh, local business owner, uh, pays taxes, and he happens to run a car wash. Um, understandably, he wasn't uh, terribly enthused about another car wash coming into the township and saw an opportunity to uh, participate in the public hearing just to simply say that he wasn't in favor of the rezoning. Uh, made it very clear um, his his aversion was the fact that he was a car wash owner and didn't feel that the township needed another car wash. Uh, the other letter that came, which was um, you know a little difficult, and I addressed in my comments, which is in your packet, uh, came from a car wash outside of the district, uh, very close in proximity in Clinton Township. I actually took issue with the reference to this. Uh, this new car wash being a, an up, uh, upscale car wash, if you will, a very nice high-end car wash, um, doing damage to what he referred to as mom and pop car washes. Uh, this individual is uh, owner of Jack's Car Wash, which is a you know, multi-million dollar operation operating multiple car washes in multiple counties, uh, Macomb, Oakland, uh, to name but a few. Uh, so I didn't find his complaint to be as genuine, and I didn't think it represented the best interest of Chesterfield. It certainly represented the uh, Jack's Car Wash brand very well, but, um, and I think the, the board saw through that and uh, approved uh, the uh, conditional rezoning uh, because of the, uh, the vibrancy of the project, really. So thank, thank you, I just wanted to clarify that. Any further comments from the board? Comments from the public? Right behind you, Mr. Beal, I believe the petitioner is representative. Good evening, Robert Kirk, 19500 Hall Road, Clinton Township, Michigan. Good morning, evening, or board members. Uh, what Jonathan said is correct. This is a property that's zoned C4. That C4 district, it looks like it hasn't developed in court according to its intent. Uh, they were supposed to be open spaces, athletic facilities. This is one of the last parcels left, so our original thought was to come in and get to a C3. 
during that time, a potential car wash user came on board and has interest in developing it. So we went to the Planning Commission on a conditional zoning. At the first meeting, there was some issue with regard to some of the C3 uses. That's why we offered the conditional zone with regard to this car wash and a limited amount of C3 uses. With regard to the car wash, it's not just a car wash. I can tell you it's kind of the state of the art facility. We have the developer here tonight, engineers, architects. If you'd like to see some renderings, we can show you that. The uh, site will be unique in that all of the stacking, all the parking will be behind the building. There'll be a big green space out front. So we have to go to planning for special land use and site plan on that, which, are, which we are going to do. Uh, also with regard to the conditional agreement, I spoke to Ms. Anderson. I think it's best to wait and develop that document after we go to planning commission and know it's exactly what's approved. Do you want to see any of the renderings or anything? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. Thank you. I think we're okay. Thank you. <clears throat> we will see you back, though, uh, for, your planning, or for your next approvals. Any, any further comments from the public or from the board? Motion by Trustee Joseph, support by Trustee to, uh, Domink to approve the Planning Commission's recommendation for condi conditional rezoning number 351 parcel 0935 <coughs> from C4 multi-use commercial to C3 general commercial contingent on receipt and approval of a rezoning agreement. Receipt and approval of a rezoning agreement. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Demink. Aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Supervisor Acovetti. Aye. Clerk Barry. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to Chesterfield <laughs> when you get through the process. 7E. The Department of Public Safety is requesting permission to renew, renew the agreement with DVS <laughs> Analytics in the amount of $6,949. Do I have a motion to grant such approval? So moved. Motion by Trustee Anderson. Support. Support by Trustee Demink. Discussion or questions for Director Kirsten, who is here? Questions from the public. Motion by Trustee Anderson, support by Trustee du Domingue to approve the request by the, the Department of Public Safety to renew the agreement with DBS Analytics in the amount of $6,949. Clerk Berry, please call the roll. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Domingue. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Bosman. Aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Supervisor Acovetti. Aye. Clerk Barry. Aye. The microphones are a little tricky from time to time. Thank you. Thank you. Seven F. Approve the introduction and first publication of Ordinance Number One Seven Eight, amending Chapter Thirty, Engineering Design Standards, Article Six, Grading, Site Drainage and Sidewalks, Section Three O Dash One Five Five, Sidewalk Standards amending repair and maintenance requirements and creating regulations for the deferment of sidewalk construction. Do I have a motion to approve first reading? Motion to approve the introduction and first publication of ordinance number 178. Support. Motion by Clerk Perry, support by Trust, Treasurer LaFada. This is first reading and it will be back. Any comments from the board? Uh, Trustee Vosper. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Um, Question regarding has this been re oh, I guess it has. It's been reviewed by legal. There was a attachment to that. The box just wasn't checked. And then is this um, based on modeled after any other municipalities? Do we know other organizations that have similar yes. policy? Yes. This is heavily based on the Shelby Township Ordinance. I believe it was brought forward by Treasurer Lafada as an example. Um, so it's it's heavily based on on the Shelby Township Ordinance. Do you know how long they've been operating with that type of agreement? I don't know offhand, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments from the board? Any discussion from the public on this? Uh, it's just first re uh, introduction, first publication. There will be a a meeting on this and a full discussion at the next meeting. Seeing no further comments from the board or the, or the public, we have a motion by Clerk Barry, support by Treasurer Lafada to approve item 7F as 
Red. Clerk Berry, please call the roll. Clerk Berry, aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Domink. Aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Supervisor Acovetti. Aye. Motion passes 7G approve a request from the finance department to renew Munetrix premium service web based software subscription for 2020 through 2022 with a three year price agreement at a yearly cost of $7,102, projected net cost of $3,551 with $3,551 reimbursed from the state of Michigan. Do you have a motion to approve? Motion. Motion by Trustee uh, Treasurer Lafada, support by Tr Trustee Vosberg. Discussion. Comments from the public. Motion by Trust Treasurer Lafada, support by Trustee Vosberg to approve item 7G as submitted. Clerk Berry, please call the roll. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Domingue. Aye. Supervisor Ecovetti. Aye. Clerk Berry. Aye. Motion passes item 7H approve a recommendation by Public Works along with facilities and operations to replace four rooftop, unit, rooftop units for the fire station number three, DPW, and police station from Great Lakes Mechanical at a total cost of $62,900. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by Trustee Domingue. Second. Support by Clerk Berry. Any comments? for the multiple directors who's getting new HVAC systems who are here. All these units are uh, past their useful life. We've had multiple issues with all of them. In fact, the DPW unit, for example, and the police unit have failed heat exchangers. So these are units that are critical. The one at the fire station is the central cooling unit. They have a boiler that supports all the heating and this is the central cooling cooling unit, I'm sorry, for the entire building. And that, that unit has a host of problems that it's got to the point where it's, we're better off with replacement. So it's a simple recommendation. You can see we've got several prices. We went through several different scenarios and we've narrowed it down to once again, Great Lakes. And we're asking to approve the $63,000, $63,900 to move forward with this work. Any questions, Trustee Joseph? Just um, how many rooftop units do we have at the police department? So we have, I, I forget offhand, I believe there's nine. So when that building was originally designed, I think there's either six or nine. I have a map with all the model and serial numbers. I have a problem. We're, we're entering everything to our work order system, so there's so many rooftops in my head. But I have a map where they're all identified with model and serial numbers. And the original footprint of that building was different than the way it stands now. So some of those units aren't used as much as others. It's not really a balanced load. This unit doesn't get used as much as the others, but it's still a critical unit. Now, the reason that I'm asking is, uh, I'm assuming even though there's varied workloads, when the building's originally designed, all the units are you know, there, or if there's an expansion, you add, but there's chunks of units that are there with the same working life. Part of the cost, and a fairly substantial part of the cost, is the crane. Uh, Correct. You can't just buy a unit and then a couple guys go up on a ladder and install it. Like there's some heavyweight costs associated with getting a crane out there. Uh, in terms of the, uh, if we know something is past its working life, instead of just doing one or two units, and I, and I do appreciate that now at least we have other buildings, what are, what, are, what are we looking at for the rest of the units on top of the police department in particular? So of the nine, how many are past their working life? So right now, the majority of them are. And the way we're trying to do it is we're putting this into our work order system. And then what happens is, is everything's tagged with a remaining useful life. And what we're trying to do is multiple things. Once we get all those units in, we're trying to basically come up with a capital plan. Where we're doing multiple units at once instead of these, these units as they fail. So we're making an effort to get in front of it. Not only are we making an effort to get in front of it, we're making an effort to commonize the units. So instead of having 15 different manufacturers like we do now, we'll have one or two. We're lucky, the dream scenario is to get down to one, but it's almost impossible. Obviously with your server units and other units, you'll have a few, but when it comes to parts and repairs, you can train your guys and they become more familiar with these units to do basic repairs. So to an I didn't really answer your question, I apologize, but we will have, moving forward, we will have a better plan on doing multiple units. The convenient part about it for us now with your crane fees, like you mentioned, is once again, when we do those units, because it's the same Great Lakes, they will lift the Liebert unit up and they will lift multiple units up. So we'll be using that crane 
all day instead of multiple days or multiple, you, you know, not one unit. We, right now we have three units here and two Libra units to get on the roof, so we have five units total to put up. How, how much is the crane? It can vary. It could be anywhere from $2,000. It goes on a per day basis, so it could cost you up to $2,000 by the time they get it on site and set it up. Depending. So I mean, you're and, you're, you're encroaching on you're encroaching on you know um, eight percent of the cost of one unit on the police department to put the the crane up. I mean, but, just to, just to bring the crane on board. But that's and why you, we, you basically eliminate the cost of the crane by bringing on more units. If we know we need them, why not just put more units on the police uh, for, for starters? I don't know about the other buildings, but agree with you 100 percent. But what we're looking at now with the units we have, the five units that we'll be working on. It's a full day. It's a full load. So you are correct. We are going to use that to do, I mean, if it's multiple stops. So okay. we, we're going to fill the plate with the crane all day with the two units we proposed earlier and the three units we proposed here. These are our most critical units. I do agree that we are working hard to get in front of these and come up with a capital plan where we can do multiple units up front. Yeah. But what we want to do is before we just start replacing units that are going bad just because they're going bad, we want to see how they function inside the building. And if we can eliminate a unit altogether that's barely getting used, because when you short cycle these units a lot and they don't get a lot of work, they fail almost faster than when you use them. Right. So I guess I'm, we'll expect to see when we go to more units on the police station, you'll bundle them up like this uh, to minimize and diminish the impact of the crane. Fair to say? Great point, and I agree with you 100%. If you're going to get a crane, you're going to spend that kind of money, you want to use it as, for as much as you can. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Clerk Barry. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Uh, just as I'm looking at the bids that have come in, just a couple of things I just want to state for um, the benefit of the public so uh, and transparency purposes. Uh, out of the oh, one, two, three, seven bids that were submitted um, three of them are train units uh, for a brand name two are carrier one is an and the other one is unspecified and based on your notes what i'm reading here in your executive summary is that the train units are the ones that are going to best perform for what we need and are best capable for the application or most appropriate to the application and of the three train brand uh, bids, the one that uh, you are recommending that we approve is the lowest bid for that unit, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so in addition to being the best applicable unit for this use, it's also this uh, Great Lakes Mechanical offered the lowest bid price. So. At the end of the day, what I see here is that we are getting the highest quality product for the lowest possible cost. Yes, correct. That goes back to us trying to commonize. The pro the, just to keep things kind of simple, um, the problem we have is when you start commonizing units, the intakes and the outdrafts come in at different points on the unit. So when you go to set a unit on top of an existing intake and existing exhaust, they don't always line up. So sometimes there's a lot of ways you have to rework the curbs or the intakes and sometimes it becomes more costly than the unit. So we got to do our homework whether it makes sense to keep a common unit that's already there or replace a unit by if it fits nice you put it in if it's a lot of extra engineering you don't you just deal with what you have and that's how you move forward in, in my opinion. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further comments from the board? Motion Another, by, oh, sorry. Another thought I just wanted to add on to the train. Um, they are built in USA, and number two, they, their parts are readily available um, versus the other ones, the out-of-country units that may be problem getting parts down the road. So I just want to make that clear that the parts are very easy to get, always for the trains, because they are in the United States here. Thanks. Thank you. Any further train cars or the caboose? <laughs> A uh, motion by Trustee to make support by Clerk Barry to approve item 7H as submitted. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Trustee Domink. Aye. Clerk Barry, aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Supervisor Ecovetti. Aye. Motion passes. Item Thank 8. You. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8 is public hearing. There are no public hearing. Item 9, addendum. There are no addendum. Item 10, public comment. Please limit your comments to five minutes and state your name for the record. 
Seeing no public comment, I'll move it up to board comment. Trustee Domingue. Just want to wish everybody a happy and th safe Thanksgiving and to my fellow board members the same. Have a safe Thanksgiving to you and all your families. Thank you. Trustee Vosberg. I too will echo happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Trustee Anderson. I would like to echo those sentiments. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to all. Thank you. Trustee Joseph. Thank you. Um, no surprise. My comments are a little bit longer than Thanksgiving, but I'll, I'll get through them quickly. First, um, budget. We talked a little bit about it. Um, the uh, first uh, big work group that we had, I was uh, very appreciative um, in, in also um, for not only the department heads, but the um, work that our finance department has done. So uh, Treasurer Lafada's team, Vicki Bauer's team, uh, a lot of work over there, and thank you for that. Um, the bridge, a trustee, uh, Supervisor Acovetti uh, pointed out, um, wanted to draw people's attention to an issue that came up, uh, it's actually one week ago tonight. The um, New Haven uh, Village uh, had on their agenda an issue involving our Chesterfield Township Police Department, or Fire, Fire Department. Um, the, the actual agenda item was Chesterfield Township Fire Protection Proposal. Um, village President uh, Dilbert acknowledged our supervisor who was in attendance that evening and I heard from uh, individuals in New Haven, particularly board members there who were very, very upset about our presence in New Haven, this proposal that was uh, brought to their board and deliberated only in closed session. Uh, some of their elected officials indicated to me that um, they felt several times that the issue being in closed session was you know, very inappropriate. Uh, there were a lot of sort of very ugly rumors between the New Haven and uh, the Chesterfield firemen about what was really happening there. There were some assurances that there would be no uh, sort of liquidation, if you will, of the New Haven department. And um, the proposal that, or, or the idea, I'm not sure what we're calling it, but the Chesterfield uh, plan called for basically um, Chesterfield firefighters servicing that station. There, there was no room for um, the New Haven Fire Department as it exists now. Uh, their board members were very upset. They felt that um, there wasn't a real clear uh, dialogue. And so when some of them contacted me and wanted to know what our board position was and what, what we anticipated, uh, you know, I couldn't answer their questions because there had been no board action this was not an issue that was discussed by our board at any time. I was unaware that there was any offer uh, being proposed. I was unaware that the agenda item uh, was placed in the New Haven um, board meeting. I was unaware uh, that the village president had been here in our township meeting uh, with Supervisor Acovetti and uh, tried to uh, understand what had occurred uh, for several days after this meeting. And I think I, I think I kind of understand. Um, I'm just terribly disappointed that it, I think as a board we work better uh, when we have open discussions and we advise our uh, people. And I just don't like the idea of our township supervisor being in another community with an agenda item that talks about a, a New Haven fire uh, proposal. Uh, it seems like that level of involvement with another community should be something that the board talked about and um, you know that left a lot of bad feelings uh, a lot of damage I think was done to our integrity and as you see um, you know some of the comments on social media it hurts to see people commenting that you know, Chesterfield's dirty politics are making their way north that that just hurts and I think it it could have been handled uh, in, a, in a much more transparent way um, I, I uh, expressed these concerns to uh, the supervisor, I felt um, we had a pretty spirited discussion about it. Um, I, I don't really understand fully how it happened and why it happened, uh, but again, I think uh, we, we could use more transparency and I'll, and I'll let it go at that. Um, this incident in New Haven sort of segues into a, another area that I brought to the uh, board's attention at the last board meeting, and that is the concept of a uh, township manager or a township superintendent form of government. I um, 
contacted our HR department. I, I, after our meeting two weeks ago, um, contacted our HR department and I wanted to talk to um, the department heads and union officials first. I, I really wanted to get feedback and understand uh, what their thoughts would be on the concept. Um, I also met, as I said I would, two weeks ago with Ms. Bauer, who was gracious enough to take some time uh, outside of the budget and talk to me a little bit about how uh, the financial uh, piece of a township uh, superintendent or manager would fit in. Um, publicly, uh, Supervisor, I, I don't have his words. I, I wanted to go back and look at the video. Unfortunately, the video of last week doesn't exist. You can't find the video just yet. But I think we can agree in concept that the response to my uh, statement was that the Supervisor was in favor of anything that made this township stronger. Uh, again, I'm paraphrasing, and if he chooses to you know, pin that down, but it, it, that was the sentiment that I took away from that. And as I met with uh, township employees and other board members, uh, concept has been uh, very, very well received. Uh, there are, there is still a lot of work uh, to do to, to fully vet all of the uh, ramifications of a uh, change in government structure like this. Uh, and I promise that I am trying my best to stay focused on the things that I think would make this a positive change. But I have to be truthful that it comes from a place for me personally, and I know in talking with some of the other board members, really of three years of a very, very divided, unnecessarily divided uh, board. And there are a number of issues that come um, to, to the board that are really, uh, I think, could be alleviated with a township superintendent form of government. And, in, and, and the primary reason is simply this. Seven board members here collectively making decisions on, in essence, how to spend taxpayers' money. The Township Charter Act gives the supervisor immense powers for the day-to-day -day operations, and uh, the department heads statutorily answer to one individual on this board, that is the supervisor. There are at least a dozen, and I won't get into them tonight, but there are at least a dozen examples over the last three years where I believe, uh, and in talking to some city managers around the county, where the divisiveness that we experienced on this board would not have occurred under a city manager, a township manager form of government principally because of this. A superintendent or manager answers to the entire board, and so any project of any real scope or magnitude is flushed out by the city manager. It's discussed with the department heads that are relevant, and the city manager then brings to the board the project. No politics, no interest in being anything other than the city superintendent or the city manager, no uh, closed meetings, no uh, secret meetings, no uh, everything is transparent, everything is out in the open, the discussions with the department heads uh, take place, and then the projects are brought to the board for deliberation and, and, and vote. All board members equally sharing one-seventh of that decision, and the uh, benefit to the department heads, who unfortunately operate under constant pressure, uh, because of decisions that they are brought into that are political in nature that really don't need any political, uh, you know, they're, they're complicated enough. And so when people are forced to make decisions uh, or, or hold the bag, if you will, for things like fire stations being closed or this uh, uh, New Haven uh, uh, annexation and all of these other things that have happened over the last several years, you can see where a nonpartisan, nonpolitical uh, township superintendent coming forward to the board just, just enlightens the board on the project and you take a vote. Um, I think that there will be considerable disagreement on uh, whether or not people find this advantageous or not, but what I would like to say, and I express to uh, township employees and department heads uh, today, is that I believe, uh, although the, the meeting on Friday was a bit more spirited than I would have preferred, I think I speak for, for Supervisor Acovetti as well, is that we came away with an agreement that the process itself 
is at least worth uh, undertaking. And the process uh, is, is uh, only as valuable as the integrity of the process. I heard that from the supervisor loud and clear, and that is my intent, uh, to talk to as many stakeholders in a uh, really non-confrontational way. There's nobody that's forced to talk to me. Uh, if you're interested, I'm interested in hearing from you. And uh, what I hope to do is compile a uh, pretty uh, comprehensive proposal, bring it to this board and to the public uh, by the end of the year uh, for consideration. And um, I will continue to try to, uh, in all ways, avoid any, uh, uh, well, unfortunateness that we had on Friday. I think we have at least set the stage for a, uh, a working process. Um, so uh, it's a massive undertaking, and I appreciate the support I've received so far, and I will uh, update the board and the public as we move forward. Thank you. Treasurer Lafayette. Uh, board wide, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sure in agreement with uh, Trustee Joseph. I think township manager concept would remove political aspirations uh, from the uh, township and would only uh, leave the, what is in the best interest of the residents. In other words, uh, anything that was done instead of it being a political uh, ploy or anything to gain votes would be taken right out of the picture and the board would just be looking at what is best for the residents and I, I think it might be a good concept to uh, look at. Thank you. Clerk Barry. I have no comments this evening, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I wasn't gonna make any comments, but there was a couple things that I do believe needs to be cleared up. Um, very proud of the last three years. It's pretty clear we're uh, right smack up against a, an election year in 2020. Social media is, is something you better take with a grain of, of, of salt. And I, I I'm sorry that some people's lack of understanding has led to an opinion in, in comments on this social media platform that were uh, completely misrepresentative representative of what actually happened and potentially very damaging to Chesterfield Township. To clear up the, uh, the New Haven issue, that it really isn't an issue except for with a, a member of this board and a group in New Haven. New Haven Fire Department had a fire several months back and it was determined their response as a village to that fire was not adequate for the residents that they serve. Hence, the village president reached out through Director Kirsten to myself with a concept to present to his board. And that concept has three different pieces to it, essentially. And this is action that the board did take. Um, they created a committee as the village of New Haven to determine the feasibility and future of their fire department. Um, that requires either moving to a full-time fire department model, trying to find additional personnel for a part-time or paid on-call fire, fire, fire model, or synergizing with neighboring communities for potential partnerships. The neighboring communities they reached out to was Chesterfield, Lenox, Ray, and uh, I think I believe those are the only three that abuts um, the village of New Haven. So a concept discussion was had, and this may this may alarm um, some members of this board, but uh, concept feasibility discussions happen all the time between this supervisor since I've been here, and the eight surrounding communities or entities around us, um, including the state of Michigan and the Macomb County um, are, are partners at the county. So these concept, plan, I, these concept ideas, this was not a proposal. This was a, um, 
a, a feasibility analysis for what it would look like as they determined the future of the New Haven Fire Department. Um, synergies uh, and partnerships in local government is something I believed in um, for the last and fought for for 15 years. Uh, when I was in the legislature, uh, revenue sharing was a uh, part of my responsibilities and we incorporated a, a mechanism to encourage communities to share resources when it made sense. And this preliminary concept plan, which is all it was, um, showed up on a board meeting of New Haven as a proposal. Now, that was not accurate. It is, was, 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 a, was an, an inaccurate representation and Hence, as soon as I found out about it being on the agenda through Director Kirsten and our, our police chief, of course I'm gonna show up at a neighboring community to defend Chesterfield if necessary. So it's a, a, a lot of uh, uh, noise about nothing and that's why the social media uh, misinformation that, that gets thrown out, out there without um, just knocking on the door and having a conversation um, that doesn't that leads to uh, a, a very bad place um, it puts puts you in a very difficult um, difficult position especially when you're on the wrong side of the facts and I would just urge you to uh, you know, come knock on my door I'm not a I've got, I've got a lot of very good information the township manager discussion this is the second meeting that trustee Joseph and I know he's gaining support um, I do not believe the uh, the foundation of that concept is coming from a place of integrity. I'll leave it at that. Um, that process will take a, um, I do look forward to a lot of public hearings, a lot of input from the residents to see exactly what it means to have another level of bureaucracy um, in between your elected officials and the services that we provide to see what a, um, a strong supervisor form of government on one end and a township manager form of government, which is, um, which I think is being proposed that without seeing the devil in the details, seeing the, t seeing the tax rates of communities with a, uh, with a township manager versus the direction of tax rates that, um, that I plan on taking our township, low, high. <laughs> um, there, it's gonna be a really fun debate and discussion over the next several months, and I look forward to as much input as that is possible. Um, I am, I will say one, with 100% certainty that I, my opinion is the uh, the basis for this this concept is not based on a foundation of integrity. Our next meeting is December third, two thousand nineteen, at seven p.m. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion by Clerk Barry. Support. Support by Trustee Bosbrick to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed by saying nay. We are adjourned at eight twenty-six.